thanks Luca. And in this part of the presentation, we are going to see EntopenG, which is basically a software to monitor traffic data and it has a web interface so you can basically use and top ng whenever you have a web browser available then you can you have access to your data so let's see we are going to see a little bit of the and top ng architecture and internal design because we would like to show that EntopenG is not only a tool to visualize your network data, but we will see that you can actually use EntopenG to write your own uh, scripts, for example, to implement custom monitoring logic or to implement uh, alerting mechanism, for example. So it's not only a matter of visualizing monitored data, but it's more. It's also something that you can use to implement your own logic. We will then see, uh, in the second part of this presentation, we will see uh, a couple of integration because the Open NG as an open source software uh, tends to be friendly with other software, with other open source software. And it deeply supports a lot of third party, a lot, many third party software and in this presentation we will see Grafana, the integration with Grafana and with Logstash. So I will now spend a few words to on the motivation and why it's important to actually know what's what's going on on your network. I'm I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that but let me let me explain spend a, a couple of words on this. No, those are a couple of quotes by Lord Kelvin that says, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it, basically. This is true, yes, it's true in network monitoring, but it's also true in many other real world uh, problems. So why it is important to have the control of what is happening in our network? Because on the one hand, it is important because it can help you in diagnosing connectivity issues, for example. If you have duplicate packets, if you have too many retransmissions, if you are experiencing, experiencing increasing delays, all those issues can potentially tell you, hey, there is something that is going on in the network that maybe is not really okay. You can also use, uh, the, for example, network monitoring to determine users' behavior that are actually not really compliant with your policies. For example, I have an employee that is doing torrent traffic while he is at work. Is this legitimate? From a network perspective, it is perfectly fine. I mean, Store traffic is just network traffic. Packets are coming and going. That's perfectly fine. But you want to have this kind of, of visibility because maybe your the user or your employee is not entitled to do BitTorrent traffic at work or Tor traffic at work. It's also important for security, as Luca has, anticip has, anticipated, has anticipated already. And indeed, the OpenG uh, has a built-in alerting mechanism that will send you alert whenever an host tries to contact or is contacted by a malicious host. We have blacklists that are continuously updated in OpenG with malware hosts. So, and you can not only receive an alert whenever an host tries to contact a malware host. But if an OpenG is operating in inline mode, you can also block the traffic towards the malware host. So this is basically the, 
the motivation, some, some reasons of, that describes why it's important to monitor our network. So now we can see a little, with a little more detail than TopNG architecture. But first of all, as an OpenG is, an, is a, an open source project, you can get the sources from that URL. We are now at 1300 stars, more or less, should be 1300. And if you don't want to compile and build the sources, just you can also use a packaged version to support several architectures and operating systems. Debian, Ubuntu 12, 14, and 16. We support uh, the Raspbian, and thus the Raspberry Pi. We support FreeBSD 10, 3, PFSense, and Windows. So what is the architecture of this software, of this EntopNG? Let's start from the bottom. At the lowest level, uh, at the lowest level we have the PF ring kernel module that Luca has described before. Of course, we can use the PF ring kernel module, but also the standard libpcap library to capture the packets that are actually entering our nectar card. On top of this kernel module, we have a C++ monitoring engine that features also uh, that also has an NDPI <coughs> that also has NDPI capabilities. The idea is here is to build a robust, lightweight, high-speed engine written in C++ that is able to keep up with the incoming packets and is also able to do some aggregations and some some statistics. So this C++ engine is in charge of keeping the host counters updated, is in charge of keeping the list of all the active flows that are traversing your network at every instant in time. So very high speed operation are done in the C++ code. Thanks to the NDPI, we are not only able to do basic statistics, such as the number of packets, the number of bytes sent and received by an host or by a flow. We are also able to jump into the packet payload to tell you the real application protocol. Is this Facebook traffic? Is this YouTube traffic? BitTorrent? And we can do even more. For example, if it's BitTorrent traffic, we can show you the hash of the BitTorrent file that is being downloaded. So you can see, for example, if someone is downloading copyrighted content in your net. On top of this C++ monitoring engine, we wanted to build a flexible way of creating reports. So we decided to put a scriptable layer on top of this monitoring engine. Thanks to this scriptable Lua layer, you can interact with the C++ engine, you can pull the data out of the C++ engine, and you can create your own, your own custom scripts to do aggregations, to do reports, to crunch, to slice and dice the data over time in the way that you prefer or in the way that is more suitable for your organization. At the highest layer, we use this scriptable Lua engine, the scriptable Lua layer, to provide the monitored data to a web uh, through HTTP. So, that can be used, that can be browsed using a web browser. Indeed, and OpenG features uh, an embedded HTTP web server that you can use to actually see and inspect the results of the monitored data. So, whenever you can, every time you contact a web page of OpenG, you will go through Lua, that in turn will 
pull the data out of the C++ core, we'll use that data and build the HTML and JavaScript code necessary for the browser visualization and rendering, and so you will be able to see the result of the model. So how can you, how can we actually execute a Lua script in EntopNG? Basically, there are two ways to trigger the execution of a Lua script in EntopNG. The first concerns the periodic scripts, that is, that are scripts daily, hourly, minute, that are executed periodically by EntopNG. And we use this kind of scripts to uh, create time series, to create historical records of the network activity. The other way to execute a Lua script in EntopNG is to put your Lua file under the directory script Lua. So if you want to execute that script, you just have to point your browser using the EntopNG listening address and port. And that as a user, you have to specify Lua slash the name of your script dot Lua. This will trigger the script execution specifically. And OpenG will receive an HTTP request for that particular URL. We'll detect, we'll, we'll get the file name at the end of this Lua request. We'll instantiate a Lua interpreter populated with some global variables, and we'll then execute the Lua script. The most common way for this Lua script is to return HTML code so that you put this string in your browser and you see the HTML results. But this is not necessary. You can create your script that returns JSON, for example. Or you can just use an endpoint Lua to trigger some particular action. So it's general. In, in this case, it returns HTML, but it's not necessary. You can, you can make the script return whatever, whatever you wish. So the Lua APIs that are exposed to the programmer are exposed through two different classes, namely interface and, and top. So in Lua, you have two global variables available that are actually tables that are interface and on top. And you can use those two globals to retrieve and to pull data out from the C++ core. Using the first, which is the interface, you have access to, for example, hosts and flows data. So you can use the first interface, the first class to get all the active hosts in your network. In that case, you will do interface dot get hosts info. Or alternatively, you can get the list of active flows in your network simply by calling the interface dot get flows info function. So the API is much more rich than this. Those are only a couple of examples that you can use. So to sum up, again, we have a C++ core. We use Lua to pull the data out of the C++ core and we visualize the data using HTML in a web, in any web browser that, su that supports HTML5 and JavaScript. But let's now have a closer look to the EntopNG web interface. Well, the first page is pretty, pretty basic. You just have to point your browser to the EntopNG listening address and port and you will be presented with a login page that you can use to actually have access to the EntopNG web interface. If you are running the professional version, maybe at the end of this talk I will spend a few more words on this, you will be presented with a dashboard. 
The aim of the dashboard is to give you visibility of the, of the real time and of the past day data. Indeed, on the right part of the dashboard, we have real time traffic, both for the interface and for the application protocols. As you can see, we have SSL, HTTP, and other protocols. Those are real time, second by second data. While at the bottom of the page, we wanted to give users an information on what happened during the past day. Indeed, we have the same application traffic and network traffic, but not in real time, but for the past day. In the left part of the dashboard, we wanted to give information not on the kind of traffic, not but on the talkers. So, who are the top talkers that are currently generating or receiving traffic in my network? And you will get that list on the right, page, on the right side of the dashboard. And TopNG has a pretty rich set of features. So this is a view of all the menus that are currently available now in NTOPNG version 3.0. We have basically the host menu that is the longest one that gives you visibility of layer 3 or layer 3 information. So you have access to the active hosts, you, can, you have access to the network. Networks are user can be defined by the user, so you can have an aggregate view of uh, your uh, local network that is uh, 192.168.0.1.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
aggregate their data and to collect the improved data toward a single point that runs uh, an end open G. In that case, you have an end open G that monitors remote traffic sources that are actually in probe. And the communication between end open G and end probes occurs over, it's, it's basically JSON over 0MQ. End open G doesn't care much about the source of the traffic data, that is. If you are monitoring a remote interface using a probe, or if you are monitoring a physical interface, a physical NIC card on the device, you will still have all those menus. You will still have the dashboard. You will still have real-time traffic. And OpenG is, I would say, agnostic to the kind of interface that is monitored. It will give you the list of active hosts, flows, and whatever, regardless of the kind of interface that is used. We also have uh, an alerting module. So you can configure alerts in, the, in an top ND, for example, on the basis of the threshold. You can say, if this host is doing more than x max per minute, I would like to receive an alert. Or you can say, the other way around, if I know that I have a critical web server and I know that this web server must always do at least 10 max per minute, I can configure an alert and, and say, if this web server is doing less than 10, me, than 10 megabit per minute, I want to receive an alert. And you can set alert also to, we have integration with the Slack and Nagios for the alert. So you can not only visualize the alerts in the top NG, but you can also send them to Nagios or to Slack. So if everything is suspicious, you will receive a notification on your mobile, and you have immediate access of what is happening. Finally, we have a reporting, a reporting engine to give you visibility on the historical time series that have been recorded by the software. So, using the reporting engine, you have access to the layer 7 application protocols done by every host. So, let's see, you, you can see if an host one week ago was doing a bit torrent traffic, for example. You have this kind of time series information available for us and for interfaces. And you can mix and match them together to have your own report. The last one is the... It's not mine. <laughs> the last one is the historical data explorer for to have access to the, to the flows because and TopNG is not only allows you to save time series data, but it can, it can go even deeper and send all the monitored flows to an engine, which in this case is MySQL, but you can also use, and we will see later in this presentation, you can use also Logstash, for example. Logstash, MariaDB, Elasticsearch, and OpenG can send the monitored flows to all these different uh, technologies and software. This is a screenshot, for example, uh, of the active flows page. So if you point your browser to ntop slash lua slash flow stats dot lua, you get this page. That is basically a real-time snapshot of what is going on, of, of what are the active flows in your network now. So this is a live view. This is a live view. Active flows in the network. And you have information on the application protocol. So S-Flow, Dropbox, uh, MDNS, and so on. You have client, the client and the server, their addresses and the ports that are being used for that particular communication flow. 
you have the duration and the breakdown. The breakdown gives you visibility if it's a uh, most if it's a one a monodirectional flow or if, if it's a if it's a download. Maybe if a user is downloading a file, you will see a lot of server with with the reference to the client server breakdown. You have visibility of the real time throughput, so the speed at which the communication is occurring, and you have the the total bytes available, that, that are the, the volume of data exchanged on that particular flow. Thanks to the NDPI, we can go even further. And for example, for HTTP, we use the last column to show you the URL that has been requested over HTTP. If that would be uh, a void P flow, we would have shown you the call-led parties, for example. Or if that would be a BitTorrent flow, we would have shown the hash of the BitTorrent. So we use the last column to show the NDPI information, basically. You have the active flows, but you can use the top menu to slice and to filter flows, for example, on the basis of the application protocol. Indeed, you can pick the drop down and say, okay, I only want to see HTTP flows. There are different, uh, different ways you can filter the flows using the, the, the menu at the top of the page. By clicking on this info page, you can get an even more detailed view of every single flow that is active. See, for example, here we have the packets interior arrival time. We have the estimated good. We know the if it's a TCP flow, we have the status of the TCP flow. We have the status thanks to the thanks to the monitoring of the TCP flex. Indeed and OpenG keeps the status of the TCP flex exchanged in each TCP flow. So you know if maybe the flow is in its initial handshake where it's doing scenes in a cut, or if it has been reset, or if it has been finalized. So you have also, I would say, the status of the, of the flow. The other view, the other, one other common view uh, that can be obtained from the end of NG is the host view. Again, you can point your browser to an OpenG slash Lua slash host stats dot Lua and you get this information. For the host, we show the IP address, the number of flows that are active, the alerts, a name if it was possible to resolve the name using a DHCP or other, other protocol. We have the scene scenes, the autonomous system number, and similarly to what we have for flows, we have the breakdown, throughput, and traffic. Every host is, is clickable, and if you click uh, an host, you can get more information again. You get the host MAC address and IP address, the manufacturer, you get the total traffic sent and received, its flows, both active and uh, historical. You get a TCP packet analysis, that shows you retransmission out of order and lost path for, for that host. And if you have SNMP enabled, you can also query your SNMP devices to actually have a mapping of your host in your SNMP devices. So if you have multiple switches, you can use this feature to know and to see on which switches this particular host has been seen. In this case, it has been seen only on one switch. But maybe if you have front ports, you can see the same host as seen across multiple switches, for example. Eh, OK, every. So this is just the home page of this host, as you can see from the 
the icon of the home at the top. There is a whole set of information available for an host that includes traffic analysis, ports, its peers, ICMP, ARP, historical traffic records. There is a very huge amount of data available for a single host. And again, this in these pages, this information is shown as HTTP, HTML. But you can use Lua to get this information and create your own custom script. For example, this is a view of the of an host protocols page. So you have all the layer seven uh, protocols seen for that particular host. You have access to the historical flows of every single application protocol. You have an icon that tells you if the application protocol is acceptable or if it's something suspicious. For example, if it would be Tor, then you would have seen a different, if it was Tor, you would have seen a different icon. And for every application protocol, you have the amount of data that is exchanged, so both send and receive, and several other information. Another interesting feature is the geolocation. So when you select an host and geolocation support is enabled, you can visit the geolocation page to see for that particular host all the active flows overlaid on a geographical map. So you see the host at the center of the map and all its active hosts that are going towards remote places in the world. So thanks to the MaxMind data, we, we are able to actually overlay these source and destination addresses on a world map and give you this kind of visibility. Uh, okay. So now that we have seen uh, a little bit of, of the EntopNG internals and of the EntopNG interface, I would like to spend some time showing the EntopNG integrations with third-party tools. Currently, the integration supported uh, this one. So for the time series, we integrate with RRDs, Grafana, and Prometheus as a work in progress. We are now evaluating also InfluxDB and uh, Snap Telemetry to integrate with EntopNG data. For the flows, we support MySQL, MariaDB, Elasticsearch and Logstash. And we are discussing to add support for, for another database, which is Postgres. So let's see now uh, the integration with uh, Grafana and Logstash. So we'll use the, the remaining time of this presentation to see an integration with the time series Grafana and the integration with flows for Logstash. So what is Grafana? Grafana is a, is a platform basically to visualize your data. And it's, it's very powerful because thanks to, uh, thanks to the use of plugins, it can abstract from the storage layer that you have in your organization. So for Grafana, it doesn't matter if you are using Prometheus, if you are using Druid, the InfluxDB, and TopNG. Grafana features a set of plugins that interact with all these technologies in a way that will give you access to the time series data regardless of that particular technology. And it's also powerful because it's allow, it allows you to create custom dashboards that mix together multiple 
data sources. So you can have a single view in a single dashboard, and you can combine data coming from InfluxDB and EntopenG, for example. Dashboards are built using the very flexible building blocks that are known as panel plugins. So you can use a panel plugins across multiple dashboards. You can reuse it to do the same chart across multiple dashboards. So with EntopenG, we wrote, we integrated EntopenG directly with Grafana. So without going through any time series database or with any database at all. So we used a plugin available, which is a simple JSON, that we extended to add authentication support. And using that plugin, we have been able to allow uh, communication between Grafana and, and OpenG using uh, JSON as an exchange as the format for exchange data. Currently, the data that we expose in Grafana from and OpenG are interface and host traffic in terms of uh, bytes and packets, plus the application protocols. So the time series, the metrics that are exposed, here, here we have examples of, ta of metrics that are exposed. So you have basically interface and the name of the interface underscore or protocols, or host, the IP address of the host, and the, the description of the metric. You don't have to learn this because Grafana features an auto-completion. Features auto -completion. So as soon as you start typing, for example, the IP address of this host, you will see all the metrics available for that particular host, and you can simply select the metric of interest. So how can we add an OpenG to Grafana? Pretty basic. You can open your Grafana and add a new data source for and open G. The type must be simple JSON, which is the plugin. Actually, it's simple JSON, but we are now working on the uh, on the end open G plugin. So we are in touch with the guys at Grafana, and we are moving from this simple JSON to our <coughs> custom plugin. You only have to set up the HTTP endpoint using the slash Lua module Grafana. So Grafana will start issuing HTTP requests to that particular endpoint that in turn are handled using Lua. And then here you want to specify basic authentication and a username and password that are recognized by and OpenG. So as I mentioned before, if you want to add a graph, an EntopenG graph to your Grafana dashboard, you can select a time serial and start typing the name of an interface or of an host, and you will get out of completion. So let's say that I want to chart the traffic in a bits per second of my interface. What can I do? It's pretty basic. I select the graph, I specify the name of the time series, and at this point I only have to maybe set a custom name, but the important thing is to just configure the axis to make sure it will have a unit of measure in bits per second, because I want the y-axis to be meaningful, and Grafana can't know that a priori. We must have Grafana that. So three steps, time series name, axis, a very short title, and we can get our chart in Grafana. At the top of this slide, we have the Grafana chart, and in the background, we have the same chart as shown by EntopenG. So you can see this chart if you visit the interface page of EntopenG. But at the top of this page, you have the very same data 
visualize it in Grafana and exchange it over HTTP. And as you can see, of course, those two graphs are equal because the data is the same. It only changes the, the visualization environment. So let's now see. Oh, yes, that. Question. The data that's getting pulled, is that getting pulled from the RRD or is that trickling to Grafana over time? Now it's pulled by RRDs. We would like to stream data using a WebSocket to Grafana. We are in touch with the Grafana team that they are developing a technology that will allow that will allow us to use WebSocket. At that point, we can keep a connection open and streaming data points one after the other. Is for now is RRDs. The okay. data is RRDs. Is yeah. this only available in the pro version or the standard? No, the standard. Okay. The standard. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see how we can now in the previous slide we have seen the interface speed. But let's try to go even further and visualize a stacked chart of all the application protocols that have been seen on that particular interface. So again, I will start typing the time series name, which this time will be all protocols, bit per second. I will select the same unit of measure for the axis in bit per second. But this time, in order to have a meaningful y-axis, I want also to the stacking option for the chart. As soon as I do these three simple steps, I end up in having in Grafana a chart like the one shown at the top of this slide. And again, as a comparison, we put the very same chart in the background of this page. And this chart is what you get from within the NTOPNG web interface. And as you can see here, those two charts are identical, but of course, one is shown and rendered in Grafana, and the other one is shown and rendered in NTOPNG. For example, here we see that this particular interface has seen a lot of Ubuntu one traffic. Maybe someone was downloading an, an ISO image of Ubuntu. There's a little bit of traffic, of Facebook traffic here, and the rest is other SSL. So if we want to put all the pieces together in Grafana, we can create a dashboard like this one. Unfortunately, the quality of the projector is not that good, so not sure. However, yes, just by putting all the pieces together, we can build a Grafana dashboard like this that gives you traffic and packets for that for a particular interface. It gives you also the average and the total values of the traffic as well as the application products. So you can use the Grafana plugin, you can use the Grafana dashboard, you can use the Grafana panel to integrate and open data, for example, with your own dashboard with your own uh, data sources and you can so this is an effective way to combine NTOPNG with other data sources. The next things that I want to show now that we have seen an integration to chart the time series data, I want to show now an integration to actually store flows data. And do this, I would like to use Logstash an example, as an example. You know, Logstash is basically a pipeline that somehow ingests data, do some processing that can be augmentation, aggregation, filtering, and then sends data downstream to a stash, a stash or a database that can be MongoDB, Elasticsearch, or, or any other database. It's very, so how does NTOPNG send the data to Logstash? It sends the data to Logstash using JSON. So every time a flow is expired in NTOPNG, 
expected flow is sent to Elasticsearch encoded in JSON over UDP or TC2. We will see that later. <coughs> so how can we configure Logstash to ingest data from NTOPNG? We can create, this is a very simple pipeline configuration file for Logstash, very simple. But basically you say Logstash, hey, I want, I want you to listen on that particular host, on that particular port, and we must tell Logstash that the codec we use is JSON, so Logstash we know that the data received on that particular socket will be JSON encoded, and we just give a simple type, and top ng Logstash. This is a, an example, I only use the standard out to, to print the received flows by Logstash. With this pipeline configuration file, we can simply start Logstash, and we can check that as soon as we start Logstash, it will listen on the IP address and port specified in this configuration file. So at this point, Logstash is ready to listen for incoming connection, incoming TCP connection on that particular address and port. On the NTOPNG side, it's even simpler because we only have to tell NTOPNG minus F, minus cap F, and then we tell NTOPNG use logstash, this is the IP address, use the TCP protocol and the port. That's all. From that point on, NTOPNG will start streaming, no, will start sending flows to Logstash. This is an example of a flow that is received by Logstash and printed in the command line. As you can see, flows, has, flows have a very rich information that include the application protocol that is HTTP in this case. For example, when I generated this, I was using Grafana as well. And indeed, we see in the HTTP URL, we see that I was actually contacting the Grafana query. Indeed, I, I was using Grafana when doing these slides. So this is an example of, a, of the flow that can be received in Logstash. So well, I think, 12.30, so I can wrap up now and conclude this part of the presentation. So we have seen NTOPNG as a scriptable monitoring tool that you can use as a as is to monitor your network, but you can also use uh, NTOPNG to create your own custom Lua scripts as well as integration with third parties. We have integrated it with uh, RRDs, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Grafana, and we are, but we are working now on the integration with the Snap Telemetry and Prometheus. And yes, so thank you. If you have a question, I will be happy to answer. Simone, uh, so you have I do remember me playing with Antrop and NTOPNG in the past, right? And playing with NTOPNG alone. So, when we do start NTOPNG, we do rely on the fact that we do monitor local interfaces only. Local to the machine where NTOPNG runs, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do the same thing as we do with the Wireshark? You know, I can start the remote pickup daemon on a remote machine, and then uh, I'm not sure if Linux uh, Wireshark, I know that Windows Wireshark supports remote interface. It's kind of double traffic in the network, but it gives, let's say, me chance if I if, if I will install a remote pickup daemon on multiple machines, right, then pop up Wireshark on one machine and just pick up, you know, traffic. We, we have, we have in Is it something similar that you can do in uh, and, and top of or we have to do, or we have to use and grow. No, you, I mean, the communication between Enprobe and OpenG is 
j is on over zero mq. So provided that you are able to create your own zero mq endpoint and to provide the data as it is expected by EntopNG, then you are free to use your own software. Yes, but the fact of the graphing, graphic in the flow is on the entrop side. In, right? Yeah, in that so, mode. So, so what I was saying, <laughs> that instead of looking at the local interface, can EntopNG look at the you know, remote interface, assuming that some sort of, it's done in the Wireshark, for example, right? So maybe I don't understand the, the question. Um, Can you help me? Okay. In the Wireshark, right? So, so what you do? No, we decided not to, not not. To, okay. not to do this, but uh, to do it in a different way. Like Simone said, we have zero AQ, and you can create uh, a, basically a cluster of NG instances. So suppose that you want to monitor this room or the Carnegie Mellon University. In each room, you put uh, an top NG instance. You can create uh, a further instance that talks with the bottom instance. So in essence, instead of propagating packets, you propagate flows, what Simona showed you here. And this is embedded as part of EntopNG. We have decided not to propagate packets, but flows, because this is much more compact, and we don't want to disclose too much information, I mean, packet payload to this. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Simon, you uh, mentioned the icon that you were showing on, a, on the Head to Flows page. How do you determine what is a good and what's bad? You, you, oh, that's you said that the term was bad, so I was wondering, okay, well, why did you determine that? That's a good question. It's pretty arbitrary now. I'm sorry? It's pretty arbitrary. Oh, arbitrary? Okay. Arbitrary, yeah. We do support also uh, classifications of domains using third-party software. But for the protocol, it's basically pretty arbitrary. Lunch time? Or more questions? I think it's time to eat something. Okay, so let's have lunch.